Uh, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Did anyone partake in Ash Wednesday? Anybody? Nobody. Nobody ashes. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Ash Wednesday is not just a Catholic thing. It's a, it's a church kickoff, right, for a season of penitence and repentance, right, for all churches, the universal church. And we call that season Lent, right? Lent actually means new life. And it's marked by a time of fasting, right? Is anyone fasting or fasting something? All right, we got some hands. Anyone care to share what they're fasting? Coffee. Social media. Ooh, that's a good one. Lots of time on your hands now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, we fast things, right? So fasting, uh, the, the origin of fasting is actually from the Hebrew word psalm. And it means to abstain from food, right? So in scripture, we see that when people fast, they're, they're abstaining from food. So there's something special about that there. But we have expanded fasting into abstaining from other things, right? And so we see things like coffee, social media. And, you know, there's great joy in that because what we're supposed to do is when we fast those things, we make room to make for God to move, for us to fill those spaces in our lives with a dependence on God Almighty. And, you know, fasting uh, has been an encouraging thing for me to hear about lately because I hear people, uh, they're fasting things like gossiping, right? Some of you are like, oh, what would I ever talk about? Right? But yeah, people, someone is fasting gossiping. Someone's fasting pornography. Right? Really trying to cut that out. Someone's fasting retail therapy. Right? Buying things when they're stressed. Because let's be honest, this is just frivolous spending. Right? But at the same time, there's this burden that comes with the fast. There's a burden that comes with this act of repentance. Right? There's a lot of complaining. Like, oh, bake sale, but I'm fasting. Like, what would I ever do without processed sugar in my life? Oh, 40 days without soda. Like, oh, you know. But, like, people have real gripes, right? When my wife does not drink coffee, she's not the same person. It's very different, right? So I told her, not, don't give that up. <laughs> but fasting, we, we have a dependency on things because Naturally, we like comfort. And we see in Matthew 6 even, when you read the Bible, it says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. We have been complaining. We as humanity have been complaining about fasting for thousands of years. That's what scripture tells us. We have been complaining about the fast for thousands of years because we love comfort. We love comfort. But let me tell you today, repentance and fasting should be exciting. It should be exciting for you. It is an opportunity for you. It is an opportunity for you to commune with God. It is an opportunity for you to understand him better, to delve into a relationship with him deeper, to really experience his presence and his power. That is the point of these things. Why do we do them? Why is that important? Because Jesus is worth it. Amen? Because Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. And let me tell you, I'm going to be really honest today. My primary purpose to come to church is not to make friends. Right? You're all great people. But that's not our primary purpose. That's not my primary purpose. Right? Having relationships with each other and being in community with each other is just a small part of church. We're called to pursue a relationship with the Father, with God. And I'm going to tell you something about community. Community doesn't exist for you. It's not even for you. Community is for God. You know, the theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer says, if you come with your own agenda for community, you will destroy the church's community. The community of God is for God. It exists for the church. The friendships we build here, the relationships we build here, they're a byproduct of running the race together. And so, if we can live together, encouraging each other, pushing each other to live into the power of God, to encourage each other, sharpen each other, rebuke each other, push each other forward, live lives that are transformed together, transform in the area or a region together, I'm in. I am in. 
And yes, you bet the deepest relationships you could possibly build will be formed in that way. I 100% guarantee it. But the primary reason we are here at the church is to pursue after the Heavenly Father. That is what we're here to do. So if we believe all the things that we sang about and the things that we talk here, there must be a hunger in our lives for the Spirit of God each and every single day. Not just Sunday. Every day. Right? Every day. But let me tell you, we are all one word. Busy. (laughs) We are all so very busy. Someone said, help us. Help us, Lord. I'm busy. And it takes me back to the parable of the sower, the one who's sowing seeds, right? Right? The master is sowing seeds into the ground, and there are different types of soil. I believe more than ever, we are all, we have become thorny soil. We have become thorny soil. We have been pushed and pulled by all the things of this world, the worries of this world, the riches and the pleasures of this world. They choke the seed. And what does it say? The scripture tells us it prevents the fruit from growing from the seed. Because we're just so busy, more than ever busy. So many distractions. But we are being invited by God. We are being called by God to experience a joy that this world cannot even come close to. When we read through John, as we continue through uh, the book of John, we're going to see so much of that. But right now, for today, we're going to look at three joys, three joys that God is calling us to experience. So before we go into the scripture, can we just prepare our hearts? Let's bow together. Let's pray. Let's submit to the Lord right now. My sense right now, you know, more than anything, is we need to really just submit to the Word of God. So, Father, would your, would your Word be higher than anything? Would it hold more authority than anything in our lives? We pray that you would speak, that your truth would be heard, and that your people your people would be good soil, Lord. That you would soften hearts. You would transform them. You would move in them. That God, that they would fall deeper in love with you. May all glory go to you. So, Father, we ask for more of your spirit, more of your presence, Lord, more of your power, more of your peace, more of your truth to be in this room, God. Would you flood this place with with your presence, God? Would you speak over people? Would you bring dead things to life, Lord Jesus? We pray, Lord, for revival in this place, Lord, in Jesus' name. We submit this to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm reading from John 3. This is verse 22. So I'm going to read some section of the scripture and then we'll talk about it. Verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water. And people were coming and being baptized. This is before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing, and everyone is going to him. So we're going to stop here. So the scene right now we have is right after the conversation with Nicodemus. Last week we talked about a conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Some time after that, Jesus and his disciples, they're in the country, and crowds of people are out there with them that want to be baptized. Right, this is really cool here. People have followed Jesus and John the Baptist out into the countryside. They are seeking out these teachers to be baptized. And we do know that John the Baptist's ministry was one of repentance and baptism. Right? And so there are two things we really need to rejoice about here. This is our first joy that we have to experience. We must experience the joy of repentance. We must experience the joy of repentance. See, the origin of baptism is actually cleansing. 
ceremonial cleansing. So a lot of things in Jewish law deemed you as unclean. So you needed to be cleansed in, in water, in living water, in order to really gain back that clean status. Right? And there are two things we see here that we need to rejoice. One is there's access and readiness. Access and readiness on Jesus' part and John's part as well. Right? Jesus here, he wasn't actually baptizing. His disciples were the one doing the baptizing. But his ministry was baptizing. Right? So Jesus, right, he goes into the countryside. People follow him. People pursue them. They go. They were like, we want to be baptized by you. They offer it. They give it to them. It's free. There's no test. There's no qualification. There's nothing they have to pass. They just give them that baptism. That is beautiful. We have to celebrate that because it is so accessible and our Savior is so readily to give it to you. It's free. The second is repentance is something that we can receive if we seek it out. If you are looking for repentance, it will be right there for you. Repentance will always be right there for you. It would never be hidden. Mercy is freely given to you by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Freely given. There's great joy to be experienced there when we repent and we know God forgives his people so freely, day in and day out. And all of a sudden, you know, like, I, I think it's sincere. I think it's sincere when we have a posture it's like, oh, God, I'm so bad. Like, Lord, I'm so bad. Or I did the sin again, Lord, I'm so bad. You know, and like we have that like guilty posture, right? I understand that. Like, I, I think it makes sense. Like, logically, it makes sense. But man, Jesus' mercy is just so free. It's so lavish. His grace is so abundant. He says, okay. You are not perfect, but you have not disqualified yourself as my child. So do better. And you will mess up. You will mess up, but do better. Move forward. Be sanctified. Live into that spirit. And then celebrate that. Celebrate the repentance that we have. Seek joy. Experience that joy. And then even here in Scripture, we see that joy is so easily snatched away. So easily snatched away. John's disciples end up arguing with a certain Jew. What, what they're saying is there's just some person there that is complaining about how bapti baptism is being done. Essentially, they're saying, oh, I saw another teacher do it another way, and I think that way is better than this way. So they got into a little argument about the nuances of it. And then John's disciples go up to John. They're like, listen, teacher. We have a crowd here, but the crowd that's going to Jesus' baptism, that's getting bigger. We're losing people to the other baptism. They're competing. They're eyeing. They're envying. And they even say, you know, we know you testified about him as the Messiah, but, I mean, what about our ministry? Our, our ministry needs to thrive, too. We're losing people then. That joy is so easily snatched away. And I'll tell you, we can't take that joy for granted. I think we do a lot of times because, you know, it's an everyday thing and, you know, perspective is hard in that way. But, man, we need to build, like, a culture of repentance with each other. And that's why we talk about soulmates all the time. We need to build a culture of repentance with each other where we can just be transparent, vulnerable with one another, someone we trust, and we can repent, confess with each other proclaim God's forgiveness over each other. There's power in doing that. I hope that if you have like a best friend that you just proclaim that Jesus forgives them, there's power in doing that. There's so much power when you do that for your friend. And we grow in that way together. We should celebrate that. That is such a beautiful thing that only this community can do. Only this community can do that. And then I think about the revival that had been happening in Asbury. Right? There was a revival. It went 24-7 for two weeks. Worship. The word, nothing flashy. It wasn't like a concert. No lights, no production, no cameras, no celebrity keynote speakers. Just worship the word public repentance. It's beautiful. And a lot of times we think we need to dedicate, you know, earth, earthly or human grandiosity to God. 
right? That's why we go to like these crazy worship nights at like Madison Square Garden, right? And we need to experience this grandiosity. And like there's, I understand the logic because there, I guess like there's, there's something um, we are honoring, trying to honor God in that way. I understand that. But I'm telling you, if we want revival, we have to pursue the divine. We have to pursue the heart of God. Repentance is divine. We need to pursue that. Take knowledge. Take joy in the knowledge that you are forgiven. Take joy in your repentance. And then so we see the disciples of John, they're making a fuss about him, I mean to him, about Jesus' ministry. And John responds in verse 27. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given from them, uh, from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Disciples come. They're complaining to him. So John gives a very profound response. He actually replies with a small parable. Right? And this parable is about a bridegroom, who is Jesus, the Messiah, and the bride, which is the people of God. And what John is essentially saying here is, these people don't belong to me. They belong to Jesus, the groom. But I'm the best man. I'm the best man. And my joy as the best man is that I get to see the groom receive his bride. That is my joy. That is the joy of my life. And he says, what? That joy is mine, and it is now complete. That is John's response. It's so profound. It's so amazing. And John had followers. John had popularity, maybe a little infamy. He was, he was an upstanding guy. People talked about him. But if he wanted more fame, right, it directly contradicts what God gave him. Verse 27, right? A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. He's talking about God's calling on his life, right? If John wanted more, it would totally undermine the ministry that God gave him. He was called to be a herald for Jesus. He was called to pave the way for the Messiah. So how is he going to be bigger, brighter than the Messiah? Makes no sense. What he's doing though, what he, how he responds here is deep, satisfaction and joy in seeing God be glorified. And that's our second joy. Our second joy is we are called to experience the joy of surrender, the joy of obedience. See, how many of us here can testify confidently the same way John does? That joy is mine. It is now complete. And if you can't do that, would you examine your heart? What has God been calling you to? What has God been calling you to? And it might not be something like crazy. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to even be something long term. It could be in the short term. What if God is calling you to your marriage? What if God is calling you to tend to your marriage? What if God is calling you to tend to your relationships, your friendships? What if God is calling you to be generous? How is God calling you to be generous? What if God is calling you to be hospitable? Many of you have a gift of hospitality and the resources to do it. What if God is calling you to do that? And if you feel that, if you feel any tug in that way, why not do something about it? Why not pursue that call? Why not walk into it? Why not explore that calling in your life? If it's from God, how can it be bad? But what we can draw from John's life when we study the Baptist's life is also that success in our heavenly calling does not equate to worldly success. Success in your heavenly calling does not equate to worldly success. John wanted his ministry to shrink. John says, he must be greater. I must become less. He didn't want a big ministry. He wanted his ministry to shrink because he wanted to give it all to Jesus. Your heavenly calling being successful does not mean we will have worldly success. And I dare say, there is no worldly success ever that exists that could even claim 
to be part of a mark that celebrates and notes a successful heavenly calling. It does not deserve to be there. Success in your heavenly calling is a joy, a joy that John had that is beyond anything in this world. That is what we are made for. We are made for the eternal. We are called for something beyond what is here. That is Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, unfortunately, John, he lives this life. He lives out this special calling so faithfully. He ends up being imprisoned and executed. But that man, his joy was complete because he had surrendered his life to Jesus. I'm thankful for those who paved their way for submission. I'm thankful for them. Many of us here have had a youth leader, a teacher, a mentor, someone, a friend who dedicated that time in their life or their lives to Jesus, surrendered their lives, and therefore helped you come in line, helped you follow after Jesus because they believed that the kingdom of God was worth more than anything else that they could have been doing. Surrendering your life to God is going to make you like Christ. It's going to make you like Jesus. It's going to make you more like him. But many of us don't actually want that. Track with me here. When you are made more like Christ, yes, we'll share in his joy, his glory. But we will also share in his suffering, in his humiliation. It's hard. I understand it's hard. I was listening to a podcast by Christianity Today, and they mentioned this, 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 this mention of how hard it is to surrender ourselves to be more like Jesus. And they, what they said was so interesting. You know, Mother Teresa and Princess Diana, they died the same year, within a week of each other. Right? Two of the most, at the time, most profound, renowned women of their time. Both very powerful, great influence. Right, who knows how many followers they would have had on Instagram at the time, right? Great influence, these two women. Right? And he said, everyone wants to be Diana, but no one can be Diana because there's only one princess. No one wants to be Teresa, but everyone can be Teresa because all you have to do is submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. I was like, that's a word. That's a word. God is calling you to something, to build his kingdom on earth for eternity. I hope that your eyes are fixated upon eternity beyond what we see here towards what God has for you and you desire to be part of that. Amen? Amen. And then John continues here in verse 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains. Remains on them. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little backwards here because I I, I want to talk about this. Um, G, in all throughout John, Jesus makes claims about himself, right? He says he calls himself the way, the truth, the life, right? So we're gonna study those things all throughout the book of John. Jesus is constantly proclaiming who he is to the people of God. He's with them. He's incarnated with them. He walks with them. He touches them, speaks to them, argues with them. All these things, right? And so what we see here is when we reject what he has to say, you are essentially saying, you're a liar, Jesus. What you're saying is not true, Jesus. And you have rejected his claim on eternal life. And that's why we see here, John says, God's wrath remains on these people because they have rejected what Jesus has claimed for them, his promise over them, his sacrifice for them. All right, that's first. 
But what he's talking about is so profound. Verse 34 and verse 35, I want us to look at this. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Everything. Other translations say God has given the son without measure the fullness of the spirit, freely and fully. Jesus holds it all. And so when we claim that, when we claim that, yes, Jesus, you do hold it all in your hands, that God has truly empowered you with everything, everything, that you are sovereign. When we truly, truly like, press into that, when we say that that's what we believe, should we not have great joy? Should we not have great joy? Because the God of the universe has given everything into the hands of the Messiah, and the Messiah Jesus has given all of himself to you. And that's our third joy here. We need to experience the joy of the greatness of Jesus. We need to celebrate that joy. We see it in the beginning of the book of John. In the beginning, there was the word. Right? Jesus with, was with God in creation. Eternal, powerful, sovereign. The word became flesh. He leaves glory, comes to his people, dwells with the people, proclaims himself to the people. He begins overturning the ways of old. He's bringing new wine to the people. Pastor Peter, uh, he preached on the miracle at the wedding, right? He took old dead jars full of water and he made them into wine. He emptied out the courtyards because the temple was not functioning as it should. Jesus comes with an authority that no one's ever seen. He teaches the teacher of Israel. He lectures him and he says he's ignorant. All of this, Jesus in power, in glory, in authority, and he knows you. He knows you. He knows your circumstance. He knows your tribulation. He knows your complaints. He knows everything about you. That is who we worship. That is who we follow after. That is who we surrender to. That is who we work for. And you know, this world, it is promised that we will meet tribulations in this world. It is a promise. But Jesus comes with a command. He says, take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome. We don't overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world on our behalf. So why do we rejoice when we repent? Because we acknowledge the cost and we celebrate God's victory in eternity. See, I want to live a life that is transformed by grace, right? Not because I want to say like, oh, I lived a good life. I want to live a life that's transformed by grace because my Savior lived the perfect life for me. I want to honor that. I want to live a life marked by grace because when I was still God's enemy, I had a Messiah. I had a Savior who was advocating for me on my behalf. Why do I rejoice in my surrender? Because we can all testify there is no greater joy than to live in obedience to the Father. When we live fully in line to what God is calling us to, we are fully alive. I promise you. I promise you. You become fully alive. When you are living into what God has for you, there is no greater joy. That is the testimony we see here. We are fully in God's hands. God is directing you. God is the one steering the ship. We're just here for the ride. But we are fully alive. And you get a front seat to witness the glory of God. There is nothing better. Why do we rejoice in the greatness of Christ? Because thank you, Lord, that is not in, all, all in our hands, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that we have a great Savior, that we have a great Messiah to whom God has equipped all things. And we have a great Jesus who came to dwell with his people as a man, who lived as a man of sorrows, 
who lived to be denied and crucified on behalf. And we have a great Savior who was resurrected in glory, who was resurrected for you, who walked out of a grave, who's calling you out of your grave. That is who we worship. That is the greatness of this Savior. And I'm going to tell you, man, <sighs> I hate telling this story. I wasn't going to share this this Sunday, but like first service, I just felt like the Spirit was, was, was speaking. And this is something like I'm having like a hard time with, okay? But my dad's sick. Many of you know he's sick. You know, it's been a while. It's been like almost a year since we found out his cancer hit stage four. And you praise God that he's still here today. Praise the Lord. It's been hard. And I only report this to you because I'm so thankful that I have people here that pray for him. And I, I believe the power of prayer. I believe that, we are, that there, there are angels that are advocating on his behalf. I, I do. But it's hard. You know, and I think about my mom. I've been thinking about her and, you know, that woman... She's been married to this guy for 40 years, and it was not a good marriage. My mom's crazy. She says some crazy stuff. Right? I'm married. She says some crazy stuff to my wife. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's my mom. That's who she is, you know? She's been married to this guy for 40 years. It was an abusive marriage. It was a hard marriage. And I got to be honest, I had been telling her to... I've been telling them to get a divorce. Because a part of me stopped believing that God could breathe life into their relationship. I'd been telling them to stay away from each other because they hurt each other. And I believe, I, I still believe that's healthy, sound advice. The other day, you know, my dad had to go to the ER because he had chest pain. It was really scary. I was at church. My sister took him. She was with him at the ER 10 hours. I went into the city to pick them up. They cleared him. Everything was okay. He had peace of mind. Things were good. He was home. He was hungry. My mom made him soup. Kimchi jjigae. Right? She's really good at that. She heated it up in the microwave. She fed it to him. He said, it's cold. She said, oh, I'm sorry. She put it in the microwave again, heated it up, gave it to him. It's still cold. He started getting angry. She did it again, gave it to him, and then he started cursing at her. He said something I can't say here, but he said in front of her, my, my, their grandchildren, in front of everybody, he started cursing her out, telling her how bad of a wife she was. I saw how hurt she was. She just walked away. She was so ashamed, so saddened. I sat down, I could tell she was kind of crying by herself. But that woman, she still holds on. She believes at the depth of her heart, she still hopes that God will do something, that they will be able to experience a good marriage. They're almost 80, they're 77. But she's still holding on to that. She wants to live in a good marriage with this guy. She wants to be happy with him. She believes that he'll be saved. She believes that he'll be healed. And she contends for him, even when he treats her like that. I love my dad, I do. But my mom, she shows me what holding on to faith looks like. I hope that we can do that together. Let's pray together. <sighs> yeah.
my sense right now is that there is a, a, a dissatisfaction. A dissatisfaction with your faith. Mm, maybe, where you're, maybe where you are in it. Maybe, how, maybe you haven't progressed in a certain way. It's not coming out to what you wanted it to look like or what you thought it should look like. You know, like we have, with our human eyes, a lot of times we, we envision something for ourselves. We make a plan, right? And some of you are very good planners, don't get me wrong. But that plan will never be as good as God's plan. And right now, to those of you who have that, that discontent, who have a desire, a hunger, for God to move, to do something more. I just feel the Spirit saying, will you trust me? Will you trust that I got you? I got you. That the birds in the air, they don't worry. The lilies of the ground, they don't worry. If I got them, I got you. I got you. Many of us have been praying, show me your glory, God. Many of us have been praying, show me your glory, God. I pray right now that we would take steps to do that. God will not withhold himself from you when you surrender yourself to him. He will not. He has given himself freely and fully through our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you believe that today, would you pray with me? Lord, here I am. God, would you give vision to my brothers and sisters? I pray that you would give them vision, conviction, discontent with where they are now, Lord, that they would desire to be working for your kingdom, that no place on this world, no job, no career would satisfy them, but they would thirst for the eternal. We know that eternity is on the horizon, God, We trust in your hands. Would you use your people? So, Father, would you uncover ears that have not been hearing for a long time? Would you open eyes? Would you awaken sleepers? That, God, we would live, that we would hear, that we would obey, and that we would truly be the people of God the royal priesthood that you call us to be. Send us, God. Send us, God. Yeah. I pray that you would ignite a fire in hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.